Praise the Lord. It's good to be here with you. And uh, we want to share with you, first of all, a PowerPoint of our last latest trip my wife and I took. It was mostly in the Arab world, which you'd say in the Muslim world. And uh, it's not what you think. They welcomed us warmly. And we'll share that with you. So we'll begin with the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, of course, that's us. <laughs> and uh, we were with Operation Mobilization at this time, which is uh, basically started as a youth movement to motivate young people to go to the mission field. And the founder of it took the first group to Mexico. And uh, just a few of his students from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And then it grew. Now there's 6,400 of their missionaries around the world, as I'll share in the slides. And uh, the focus of our ship ministry? Is to bring knowledge, help, and hope to the people of the world. Um, Operation Mobilization has over 6,500,000 6, missionaries, yeah. and uh, we work in over 110 countries. And... Uh, this is where we lived, right? <laughs> we lived here on board this ship. And it's the largest uh, floating bookstore in the world. One whole deck is reserved for all different kinds of books, religious books, Bibles, novels, um, just anything that you're looking for, even medical books, books on computers. And um, during the day when we're, we're at dock, um, we have lots of visitors that come to the ship. Some days we have over 10,000 visitors that come to um, buy books and to share the gospel. And we've had as high as 28,000 in a day, <laughs> which is phenomenal. And the part of that book display is a maze where you go through and it tells the story of the prodigal son in the local language so the people get the message. And uh, it's interesting, people of every faith come to see. Here's some of the places we ministered. This was the uh, Indian lady in, on the left there. She was a pastor of a church in Abu Dhabi, which you say, wow, Muslim country. And she, yes, she was, and she did a good job. Highly respected and uh, a powerful ministry. And on the right is another pastor's church where we spoke and uh, that's some of their staff and their people there. And what a blessing to be there. And then we came into one port and they said there'll be dancers out on the quayside, which we call the dock, the pier, on the quayside. So they said, please go down and listen and greet them. And so we went down, but we were some of the first down, down the key to the quayside. And so they grabbed us and put us in their dance line. <laughs> and they gave us a stick, and it was part of the, I forget all that we did, but mm -hmm. uh, it was, and they had drums beating on the left there. And that's the captain with the, the other white man here. And uh, so that was a beautiful welcome, very interesting, very warm, friendly people, very kind to us. Not like you read in the newspaper about the Muslim extremists. <laughs> We didn't find those. They come to America, or they go to the ISIS. But they told me when ISIS is recruiting, crime goes down in the United Arab Emirates, because all the bad people go there where they can kill with impunity and, and never be punished for it. And here we come into Ras al Khaimah, and it was, it's a beautiful place. And we were welcomed, as it says, by the Arab police band with bagpipes, bag playing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. We thought we were in church, <laughs> and that's in an Arab country, and Muslims. These are Muslims. Amazing. But also, they play that in the Russia. When Billy Graham was there, the Russian army choir sang Amazing Grace for his, his uh, visit there. And then... These are hundreds of young people and their teachers came from all the schools around, Muslim schools. And they greeted us, welcomed us warmly. And they, there are some buses there 
full of these young people and the buses kept coming and coming. Thousands of young people came through and bought Christian books and other books and, and uh, were, went through the maze about the prodigal son and the story of salvation. And this is Christmas. Every Christmas we all go out on the bow of the ship. This is about 500 of us out there. And you can see we're a little spot down below that square there. But, uh, and you see other Canadian flags there too. So we had quite a few Canadians on board, but people from 50 different countries. Even China, when it was closed to other things, they'd get out to go to university and come to the ship. <laughs> and uh, so it was, we had people from unbelievable countries. And this is a group lining up waiting to visit the book fair. Uh, and they actually, that's a shorter line. It gets longer and longer, snaking through, and they wait patiently to get to see our ship and uh, to visit the bookstore. Amazing the crowds that come. And here's another picture of the school kids later, another day. And see the buses back there? There's a lot more than those buses came after and kept coming and kept coming. Thousands of kids came uh, to, to visit the ship. Um, during our port visits, uh, whenever we sail into one port, we have a special welcome from the president of that country, or um, kings or ambassadors, just someone with great influence. And on each side here, the people on the ship, they dre dress up in their cultural outfits and they, um, they welcome the, uh, the president. So it's quite a, quite a thing. It's quite beautiful, all their different costumes. Um, on the ship, I was kind of a mentor to some of the young girls. And on the right here is Matilda from China. And her story is really different. Uh, her and her mother were watching a soccer game in China one day. And one of the spectators had on their one of the players. The players had on their shirt, "I love Jesus," and they're saying, "Who is this Jesus person? We've never heard of him or her." They didn't know, and so Matilda went home that night and she googled it, <laughs> and uh, she said, "Wow, this person is really, really a wholesome person." So after that, um, they both came to Christ, and um, because they couldn't be baptized publicly, they were baptized in their, ba in their bathtub at home. Her and her mother both uh, came to Christ after that. And then she came on the ship because she wanted to learn more about missions. She wanted to be a missionary, and uh, today she is doing really well. Mm -hmm. And the other girl, uh, Corley, she's from South Africa, and uh, her too, she uh, wanted to learn more about missions and uh, where she could go to serve. And uh, they're on the ship usually one to two years uh, getting prepared. When they come to the ship, they all have to speak English, no matter which country they come from. And um, then they're taught how to become missionaries. Mm -hmm. And um, so these two girls are doing really well. And another one, um, this little girl, well, she's not a little girl, <laughs> but she's from Germany, and um, I was encouraging her because she was leaving the next day to go home, and she was really um, nervous because once they come from the ship and they go home, they don't really know what they're going to be faced with. And um, a, lot of them, a lot of their friends, they don't know what they've been through, and um, so kind, they get kind of rejected because they've changed a lot. And um, so she was talking to me about it, and uh, I was trying to encourage her that everything would be fine when she got home. Many of them come to the ship as teenagers, just teenagers, they leave as adults mm -hmm. because of what they see in the different countries we go to. It just, they grow up. And we regularly teach them that. There's devotions every day, and then different events going on and I've taught in a couple of hundred, hundreds of them I think. And we preach in various places in a palatial church or in a tent. And uh, that's what we do when we're on the road in many, many countries. I preached in about 50 countries. 
This is in the Arab world where they don't want Christian churches. You heard that? <laughs> this property for this big place was donated by the emir in one of the United Arab Emirates. He donated the land. And then when they needed to raise money to build this fabulous church, the, he allowed them to use his private golf course to raise funds. So they had a fundraising event in the golf course. And they were able to build this. 57 different churches meet here, like you read there in six different size rooms at selected times between 5.30 a.m. How would you like to have church that early? <laughs> and 10 p.m. And it goes on all day. And this, see the crowd on the bottom there? They are, um, every day when you go there, they have tables set out and people serving tea, coffee, uh, and they're baking for all the people from any denomination that come there. It's fantastic. I, uh, I saw the church coming together in an unusual way, which was very beautiful. <coughs> and uh, uh, the emir supports this, encourages it. He doesn't want churches everywhere because that wouldn't look too good in a Muslim country. So he built this, or he helped build this. Well, you sat beside the emir during uh, November 11th service. Yeah, uh, when there was a November 11th uh, um, uh, memorial service in uh, Abu Dhabi, I believe. I had the privilege of sitting on the platform with the emir, the ruler of that, that kingdom, that Muslim kingdom. He a very friendly guy, talked good English, and I could visit with him. Even sang Christian hymns. Oh, he, he sang Christian hymns. Yeah, right, I forgot that. <laughs> he sang along in the hymns, he knew them. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you so much more, but we don't have time because they're very open to the gospel. Uh, the pastor we were with in that place, he had been invited to Arab leaders discussion groups. I forget what they called them, but he went and they would ask him all kinds of interesting questions about the Christian faith. And they weren't shy to speak about it. And uh, yeah, amazing, amazing things. You think the Arab word is closed? No, it's open. The most powerful impact I've heard from the missionaries that's ever been made on the Arab world was that movie made by, I forget, Passion of Christ. Uh, and it, it was showing when we were there a hundred times a day throughout the seven emirates. A hundred times a day. One theater where they had uh, five separate theaters in the complex, a big complex. They usually they have different movies in every theater. He had to get rid of the rest of them and just show the passion of Christ in all of them. That's how much demand there was for it. And he called one of our, our missionaries who was a quote, a businessman, he wasn't a missionary, but he knew he was a Christian. So he said, can you help us? People are leaving crying or they're sitting there and not wanting to leave because of what they heard about Christ. Can, if we have our ushers steer these people into a separate auditorium we have, can you answer all their questions? He said, well, I'll only do that if I can put something in their hand. And so he said, I want to give them an angel, which is the New Testament in Arabic. And so he, the owner said, yes, anything you want to give them. <laughs> So he answered the questions about Jesus and gave out angels and other tracts of how to receive Christ. The Arab world isn't what you think. It's very interesting. In fact, Lillian. <laughs> My sister, when I told her that we were going to the Arab world, she was shocked. She says, oh, you can't go there. She says, uh, you're going to get killed. I said, uh, no, no, it's, it's fine. You know, we'll be fine. God's looking after us. And she said, no, I don't want you to go. <laughs> and right till the end, she, uh, she didn't want me to go to the Arab world. But Lillian found it was, she oh, felt. Oh, yeah, I felt, actually I felt safer there than I would in walking downtown Toronto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are. Because everybody was so friendly and everybody just wanted to meet you and they wanted to, uh, they wanted to take us into their homes and feed us. And uh, they were just, so wonderful, I can't express how wonderful they were. Yeah, we couldn't accept many of the invitations, there were so many. 
And it was just impossible for us time-wise. But that's what the reception, the terrible reception we had <laughs> in the Muslim world. Uh, they were so eager to know us. And uh, one of the visitors on the ship was, he's uh, on the radio a lot or John. television, John Piper, and Lillian oh, oh, wanted sir. a picture with him. <laughs> so I was in a church. <coughs> in oh, excuse me. And then... Uh, yes, I met these three ladies when they came to the ship. And um, they crowded around me and they, they just wanted to know where I was from and what we were doing there. And, um, you know, they, they, uh, they were just so eager to learn and find out what we were doing. And uh, they were just really, really friendly. Happy and friendly. It was a very special time. And of all things, uh, this imam, who's a minister of the Muslims, and uh, he was principal of an imam training school where they train young men to become imams or the priests and ministers in the, the Muslim temples. And he came, and I'll tell you, this man had such a gentle, kind spirit. I felt right at home with him like I would with a brother. It was amazing to me. I was shocked. Uh, and um, I was thinking after a while, if I needed an assistant pastor somewhere, except the, fa the fact that he's Muslim, <laughs> I would choose him because he had a real heart for people, a real love for anyone. I just couldn't believe it. And now there are other kind of Muslims. There's another, this man brought his whole school to the ship and uh, all the young people, and they could buy Christian books and heard the gospel. Uh, but toward the end of our stay at that same port, another imam came over uh, and he was angry. He says, how come they got on and we can't get on? I said, well, the ship's clothes were packing up to sail. He said, well, I went on. And I said, I, I can't do that. And I, he was so insistent that I had to call the captain and the director down. And they came in uniform, <laughs> the captain, so that helped. And uh, told him that we can't have anyone on board now because we're doing a security search. Because often there's people who try to hide on the ship so they can get to the next port, get out of their country. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so we do a total search of all the cupboards and everything to make sure no one's on board. And we did have uh, two brothers on board. They hid in a lifeboat, pulled up the canvas, got into a lifeboat. <laughs> and the only way they were found is they came out at night to get something and someone saw them. <laughs> so a very interesting life. But this, uh, here's the school we went to visit. This is where they train imams for the Muslim leaders. I, I would like to know some of the young men that he trained because they would be good quality people. You know, not, nothing against Christians. In fact, the Quran says that every Muslim should be kind to people of the book. That's what it says. And that's Christians everywhere. So that's the real teaching. And this man got it right, others don't. So we also have a ministry uh, for eyes uh, to the poor people that I can't afford eyeglasses. So we just do a basic eye test with them and um, supply them with, um, with glasses. And they're really happy because now they can see what they're reading. And that's also in the, in the prisons as well because there's a lot of gentlemen there that have eye problems. And uh, so we supply them with eyeglasses. This is a, an orphanage we came upon. Well, actually, a Christian academy. But it, many in there are orphans and from other homes. And they had a beautiful building, big building, but it needed a lot of repairs. And our crew decided to do a mural on a big wall in one of the big auditoriums. So that's what they're doing on the top left. And the bottom left is the finished mural. And then we built them a bookcase and we filled it with books from our ship, which was a great joy to them. And there they're studying down below that. And uh, that's the academy that, where we did the work. Uh, and the roof was leaking, so we patched the, our crew, not me, patched <laughs> the roof 
and then painted the whole thing a fresh new color. So that's what our ship does. We do all kinds of things. We even built, after a disaster in Sri Lanka, when waves swept away so much and killed so many people, there were no place for the children to play except in the rubble. Our crew, our mechanics and so on, welded together things and made playgrounds, 10 playgrounds for the kids to play in in different parts of the country. That's the sort of thing, that's part of missions. And here we have, by love, serving one another. You see the bottom left there, that <laughs> young lady, you'll have to be that strong to come and work on the ship. <laughs> Actually, they're hollow bricks, so they're not, they're not that heavy, but she's from France. And uh, then they dig a garden and did a crosswalk because there's no safe crosswalk for the kids coming to the school, to the academy. Uh, also, they don't really have a very good water supply. So as you see, only um, if you want to drink that water, you die. <laughs> yeah, it, there's animals in there, yeah. feces, everything, rotting. So we do build um, or dig wells for them. And um, like I say, not us, but the crew. And um, to give them good health and good drinking water. Yeah. And if we can't do that, then we supply them with a, um, this container um, that has a charcoal filter in the bottom so that any time you put any type of water in there, it will uh, purify the water and it produces 600 liters of water per day. So it's uh, a really good source of good drinking water for them. It was designed specifically for this purpose. And yeah, they can put garbage water in there and it comes out clean and healthy. And the young lady saying thank you for the water. And this is a Russian dentist who we have on, had on the ship. It, it changes all the time. We often have dentists on there and doctors. Uh, always have to have a doctor by <coughs> law. And uh, she's from St. Petersburg, Russia. And her assistant is from Germany. So that's, they work together and on, uh, with our staff and with the people in the public. One thing, our language barrier was a problem, but not when you just love people. Love uh, has, needs no language, and they feel it, they sense it, they love it, they, they love being loved, and it has a huge impact. You can see the smiles on their faces, and uh, here again, joy and bliss as we, we talk and visit with these people and, and let them know we care. That, that alone can draw people to Christ. And these girls? Yeah, it was very interesting. We went to the Maldives, um, not the islands, because they're very exotic. But we were in the city the of- capital. The capital. We were in the capital. Mali. Mali. Yeah. And um, these, we were, um, some of our crew were doing um, animal balloons for the kids that were coming on the ship. So these two girls are from the Maldives. And they saw that we were struggling because we didn't really know what to do. Lillian and I. <laughs> <laughs> so they took over and showed us how to make animal balloons for the kids. And the next day, um, there, we found out that their, their brothers, they actually do this uh, for a living, for um, parties and whatnot. So they also came on the ship and helped us immensely that day to make uh, animal balloons for the kids. You see how many kids are gathered around, they all want one. So it's hard to keep up with the pace. And one of the most important things is we provide thousands of books. Uh, I don't know, 11,000 on display, but we have tons of them in the hold. And uh, it's interesting when we buy, we buy a whole container load, like a 40 foot container full of books. And if that place we're buying them from has outdated scientific books, outdated medical books, or outdated uh, uh, books on astronomy and astrology and everything, then they, we get them for nothing. And we sell them for a very small fee and they just think this is a miracle because some of those medical books are $150 and we sell them for $20, just covering our costs. So it's amazing what we've been able to do with literature. And that was a dream of the founder, 
uh, was, uh, was books, books, books to bring the gospel. And then here this young lady prayer, prayed for so many and it was powerful, the impact on lives, changed lives through prayer for sick children, for sick people, for every need. And this top left is Nepalese people who were there on the ship, I believe. And they were in the full regalia. And on the right, a Buddhist priest. And he was reading commentaries on Proverbs, which I thought interesting. And that's a view of our bookstore, one part of it. There's another section. But uh, here's a Muslim man perusing Bibles. We, had to, we were told by the authorities that we have to put up a sign above the Bibles and strongly Christian teaching books that for Christians only. Do you know where the Muslims went first? For the Christians only. <laughs> they don't know psychology. <laughs> they went to the by Christians only. And that was awesome. And then we have a day when we bring a lot of children from the schools on board, and we have tables set up all around our, our ship auditorium, and uh, they get taught on the cultures of the world from like our 50 countries that are represented on board. <laughs> and then we have some adventures. Actually, we were in Sri Lanka here, and uh, we were asked to um, present at one of their churches out in the bush. <laughs> and so, like at four o'clock in the morning, we had to get up and we had to take, uh, because our ship was not really near the entrance, uh, one of, uh, a truck came uh, to pick us up. There was about six of us. Pickup truck. Yeah, a pickup truck. And we rode in the back of the pickup truck. And um, so we're going down this um, country road and we've been on the road now for a couple hours. And so then um, all of a sudden I see the pastor from the Anglican Church in town and uh, he's riding on his motorcycle and he, with all his robes and, you know, he was going to church. And so anyhow, he was supposed to be going to the same church we were. But uh, in the meantime, as we're going straight down the road, he takes a left. And I said to Jack, what's going on here? I said, I thought he was going to church with us. And it was still pretty dark out. And um, so I kind of got scared. Because you hear about all these stories about missionaries being taken into the bush and you don't see them anymore. So anyhow, I, I just, you know, I, I was just so scared. And uh, Jack says, it's okay, it's okay. And th this was my first experience on, on a mission trip. So you can imagine how I felt. So anyhow, I said, okay. So anyhow, um, we... Uh, we got to the church, and the, the only reason I knew there was a church there was because we saw the, the cross, the white cross. On the lawn. In front, on the lawn. In the, and, no um, lawn. But. No. And so it was probably about 6.30, and um, there was a little lady in there getting all set up for church, and um, she was putting the, the books out. And this cross here that they've, um, they've got covered with the white uh, linen cloth, behind it when they were actually pouring the cement for this church, they, um, the face of Jesus came into their... Into the cement. Into the cement. And it was incredible. Like, you just can't believe it. That, you know, it was a miracle, uh, really a miracle. That it, uh, because they, the way they build their churches, um, they're all open, of course, and they just have the cement, and then, like, on the sides is um, another, you know... Uh, cement wall Corrug and, and corrugated, corrugated roof. roof yeah. yeah. So anyhow, um, I was still a little bit INC, you know, when I got out of the car because we didn't see anybody. We just saw this one lady. But in a half an hour, you could see all the motorcycles coming down from the bush, all all the mountain trails, and so we had quite a quite a big uh, congregation that morning. Yeah. And this area where we were was the Tamil region in Sri Lanka. And the Tamils had been at war with the government for years. But it had just stopped. And this Anglican pastor, evangelist, went out to start a church in this area. And praise God, it did well. There's a, a congregation. There's the church uh, with the corrugated roof and yeah. all the people gathered there. Yeah, it was very special. And that's the pastor, yeah. wonderful man. Oh, and after we went back and spoke in his big church in the city, 
then he invited us to dinner. And what was the dinner like? <laughs> Actually, I'm a very fussy eater. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we had um, fish and soup, and, um, but no utensils, none whatsoever. So we had to eat with our hands and <laughs> rice and all that kind of stuff. So before we ate, of course, we had to wash our hands. And uh, then we ate, and there was like banana leaves too that you could, you know, pick up the different pieces of uh, food with. And then as soon as we were finished, of course, we washed our hands again. And uh, it was, yeah, quite an experience. That, that's how God made it in the original. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we had, I was in Africa, other places in Africa, they do that too. You just uh, you use a little bit of rice, and in India, a amount of rice and amount of different sauces, and you take a bunch of rice, run it through whatever sauce you want, and eat it. <laughs> Very interesting. And this, uh, yeah, this lady, uh, she didn't speak a word of English, but uh, she wanted me to pray for her and her little girl there, yeah. and uh, she was so sweet. And um, we had like a lot, a lot of the the women come to ask me to pray for their children. Yeah, about twenty of them gathered around her, Lillian, and wanted her to lay hands on all of them and pray for them. That was a shock. She hadn't seen that before. And th this is uh, uh, some of the young people were there, lovely kids, mm -hmm. wonderful time. Back on the ship, we have a nurses always and doctor on board, but she's teaching them about HIV AIDS prevention and all that. And we do that in many ports, wherever there's a problem with that. This is our ship again, and um, mm. some of the young people are dressed in their cultural dress. Yeah. And uh, you can see that there's probably about 30 of them there, but normally we have about 50 uh, different countries represented. Yeah. And we came to Razal Kaima, which was one of the United Arab Emirates, one of the an emirate is like a, where the emir rules, but there's seven of them who have united together as one. And every year, a new emir is king, sort of, of the, all the emirates. But anyway, this is, was a, in a beautiful mall, better than anything I've seen in North America. A gorgeous, in that it was so ornate and uh, amazing place. <clears throat> and. Uh, the, our young people who go advance, we send an advance team for uh, a couple of months before our ship gets there to book a place for us to dock and to arrange for the programs that we put on. And they went to see the owner of this mall who was in, fortunately, a beautiful mall. And when they went in, they told him, but he had already heard about us from... Uh, from uh, Radio and television. No, Radio from... Mall? from uh, in Lebanon, oh. Mrs. Harari, whose husband was killed by a car bomb right while our ship was in the dock. Mm -hmm. And you could feel the vibration shake the ship. And some of her young people were nearby, but she had told every Arab nation needs to have this ship come. A wonderful international experience and lots of books for education. And he had heard about us. So when they came in to ask him, he said, sure, you can use the platform in this lower level. Uh, that's great. And he says, what about advertising? He said, well, we're looking for a place to have, get it printed. He said, don't worry about that. If you've got a rough copy, I'll get it printed for you at no cost. And I'll put it in all of our stores in this huge mall so they all know about your visit. And how many more do you want to have than that? <laughs> He paid for it all, and then he paid for our dock fees, which are thousands a day. When a ship comes in, often they offload and leave right away, but we stay. And so he paid thousands, I don't know how many thousands, for our, our dock fees. That's how mean the Muslims are. <laughs> and then on that platform there, we did an I-Night performance, international night and uh, different dances, and then they shared testimonies after. But the African choir is great, and Mexican dance, and this is a beautiful dance group. It's from Korea, uh, and when there's not enough Koreans, then other Asians fill in. <laughs> but it's beautiful. It's a lovely, moving scene, 
a very colorful. Then while we were in Sri Lanka, this brand new ship came in, a huge ship from China, one of their new battleships. And this, they were uh, Marines lined up all around the sides of the ship and a whole bunch of women on another deck uh, standing at the rail and as they came in to the sound of bands and so on. They were trying to get a, a place where they could function out of in Sri Lanka because it would give them a, a broader base uh, to work from. Thankfully, they didn't win the battle. <laughs> But this is a battleship, and I heard one sailor as he was coming down the gangway. I was in a hurry to go somewhere, so I couldn't stop. But I heard him say, praise the Lord, uh, in English. And I thought, wow, great. And we, they didn't shoot any missiles into our ship, but we shot missiles into their ship. They came, one sailor bought $500 worth of Christian books on our ship. Imagine. And another one bought 200, another one 100, and the rest bought a lot of stuff. And we had Russian people on board who, could, who got tour of that ship, too. Uh, so, oh, it's such a special time. Amazing. And then, this is in Sri Lanka. How would you like to have bre fresh bread every morning? <laughs> they bake it early and deliver it around town. That's a smart way to do it, on what they call a tuk-tuk. Uh, they putter along and do well. Have you seen any of these signs around your area? <laughs> well, there's lots of them there. And uh, some of them are not too well fed, but he could go for probably another month without eating. That's what camels are like, amazing creatures. And uh, here's a train, the kind of trains they have there. <laughs> and they make their own tracks. <laughs> and this is uh, Ab uh, Dubai. I just thought I'd show you this to see the riches that are there from oil. Uh, the Burj Caliph, the one on the left, is the world's tallest tower by far. And uh, it's, uh, I think that makes half a mile? No, a quarter mile high, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. It's the world's tallest tower. And uh, we were at the foot of it, but this in the middle is a Burj Al Arab, which is means the uh, um, Tower of Arabs, uh, the tallest hotel in the world. Do you notice on the front of it the shape of a cross? And they wanted a sail, and a sail has an upright and cross spars, crossbars. So they built it, what they wanted, a sail. And when some Arab leaders flew in and saw the Christian cross there, he was angry. He said, get that off our building. <laughs> they, the Australian architect who built it said, if we take the cross off the building, the whole thing will collapse. We can't move it, so it's still there. <laughs> Jesus' cross, right there in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. And then on the right is a year-round ski resort, in a fantastic place uh, with lots of snow inside in the desert. And we get some leisure time, and we had those shirts made in Thailand, I believe. And we get to sit down a little bit and watch the sunset mm -hmm. and other things. It's very special. When we're sailing, it's easy. This is a, a fantastic temple. Solomon's temple was supposed to be grand. I'll tell you, this is grand. Mm -hmm. uh, it is fabulous. 50,000 Muslims can worship there at the same time. And uh, here's one of the rooms that's all built into the wall. And this is one of the hallways. And on the right in black, that's Lillian walking. But that gold at the top of the pillars is not paint. It's, it's gold. gold. And, and some of the, all the fixtures they have, they're jewels, real jewels. It's uh, fabulous. They feel, feel that when it's for God, there's no expenses too much for Muslim temples, no expenses too much. And here we are at Singapore, our final stop before we came home. You see the skinny snowman they had there for us? And we went home to cold. <laughs> That's our home down at Lake Erie when we lived there. We're now in Hamilton, but 
And until our sunset, we will keep proclaiming God's love to the world. Hallelujah. I just wanted to mention one other, one other thing about the ship. We have whole families on the ship. Not just young people, but whole families. And uh, we also have a school. So a school from kindergarten right up to grade 12. And we have a bank. So actually we're very self-sufficient. And police department police and fire department, department. department. Fire department and you know, lots of crew members looking after the maintenance of, of the ship as we sail along. So it was, it was very interesting. Yeah, it is. And it's wonderful to be there because mm -hmm. the young people are so hungry as we teach them and they gobble it down and, and many of them become missionaries after that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's opened your eyes to the world. And oh, how down the other way. <laughs> that's okay. How the Muslim world is so open to the gospel. It's amazing. Father, I pray you'll speak to our many hearts through those PowerPoints, but also through the few words I'll share with them. Challenge us to Lord to do what you called us to do and to be what you've called us to be. You called us to be your own, your servants. Help us to become that more fully than ever before and to dare to have the boldness to take on the world as a project and not just a few missionary places. Teach us what it means, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It was uh, um, in Toronto. It was A.W., not Tozer, um, uh, pastor at People's Church in Toronto. Uh, oh my, what's the matter with my brain? Uh, he, uh, his name will come to me. It was he who said that if you want to build a church and you want it to grow, focus on missions. He said because if people, all they see is their own church and the little things they do, they're not going to be challenged to give more and serve more. And, but people want to see people with vision. And so he said, get a vision for the world. Expand your vision so that you can become a great church. And his church became well-known around the world, in fact, because I mentioned his church, People's Church in Toronto, and many countries, they already knew about him and about his founding of that church. He had previously been with the Christian Missionary Alliance that I pastored with, and then he began his own church ministry after that. Um, missions began in heaven, and missions will end in heaven. You might ask, why isn't the word missions mentioned in the Bible? It isn't. Not anywhere. Why? Because, as I'll show you, God's plan was all of us be missionaries. We may be good or bad missionaries, but we're all to be missionaries. That's why the word's never mentioned. The closest thing to it is apostle. Apo means away from, and stello means to send. So the apostles were sent out. That's the closest thing to a missionary. But the Bible doesn't mention missions. Why? I'll show you why. Uh, <clears throat> I saw a Christmas card a few years back, quite a few years ago. And on the cover of the Christmas card was Stalin, uh, Hitler, and uh, a few other of these notable scoundrels who have been on the face of the earth. And I thought, what a Christmas card. It had, uh, had others there. But anyway, when you open the card, you know what's inside? A manger. And, and it, on the front it says, there are many who desire to be God. And you open it and it says, but only one God who wanted to be a man. <laughs> Jesus. That's beautiful. Because that's the truth. Many want to be right at the top of things, but only one God decided to come lower himself come to earth and to be a man and walk among us and live among us and experience what we experience. He was the first and greatest missionary. He came longer than anyone else travels. He came from heaven down to this earth, knowing that he'd die here, 
That's being a missionary. Uh, my first wife was a missionary at heart. I've been married to Lillian for 10 years now. But my first wife was born in Vietnam. And she, she was willing, when I met her, she had her heart set on going back to Vietnam. And that's when the war was on. She wasn't going to let that stop her. She wanted to go anyway because she loved those people and knew them. And now she was a nurse. She could go help them. So we had to pray hard about what do we do? Do we go, let each go our own way or do we serve God together? But we serve God together. But she said, Jack, I'm willing to go to Vietnam. Even if I'm a martyr, I don't mind as long as I'm obeying God's call. That's powerful. When my mother raised our children, her, our family, she said many times, I don't care if my children go to the mission field and are martyrs there because I've raised them to serve God. Wow. That's quite a view. And she, she meant it. She was a woman of prayer. And she really loved God. And for a while there, the way my dad treated her, she became mental. I went insane for a while and could hear voices coming out of a cupboard and on the bus and people were following her, she thought. But what straightened her out was her prayer life because she always prayed every night for missionaries, for her children, and that got her back on track. And she was a gem of a lady who taught us a lot and helped us a lot. Even though she was from a very poor background, I mean, spiritually, there was nothing there in her background. So the beginning and end of missions, it started in heaven with Jesus, but it'll end in heaven too. And in chapter 7 of Revelation, it's clear and beautiful. It says here, After I looked, and there before me, was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and palms were in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And when the angels, were st the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the, the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And, and then came one of the elders and asked them, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are before the throne of God and serve him night and day in this temple and he will sit on the throne and will spread his hands over them and will be eternally with that one people of every tribe and nation well we saw a little bit of that, that on our ship 15 nations on the ship uh, approximately it went up and down as different crews came but 15 nations singing as one, rejoicing in the Lord. And this will be even better, much better. Everyone who served God and honored him with their lives, they'll be there. Martyrs will be there. People who have died for the cause of Christ. And my wife was in Vietnam when many of her nurse friends, that she, when she was a little girl, the nurses she admired and looked up to, they let her even come to the clinic and give shots to some people. And... Uh, she practiced with thorns on her little dolls earlier. <laughs> she'd take care of the dolls. And then she'd sit them in a row on the steps and teach them the Bible. <laughs> and that was her heart. 
And, you know, someday we'll, I'll see her again. But that's the heart. We need to have permissions. Even if it takes my life, I'm willing. You gave your life for me. It's my turn now. At one time, when I was young, I had a dream. And I dreamed I was at Calvary on the Golgotha. In that dream, I saw Jesus being crucified, the cruel nails pounded into his hand, into his wrist probably, not his hand, but pounded in. And the pain and agony he went through. And then they lifted up that cross and dropped it into a hole. Imagine that. And I watched, and the smell of death was there, and the horrible things they were saying about Jesus. It bothered me a lot. And then the soldier turned away from the cross and said to me, now it's your turn. Thankfully, I woke up then. <laughs> now it's your turn. He was the greatest missionary. Now it's your turn. He's calling all of us. In fact, in the Old Testament, in, in the way back in Exodus, uh, was the beginning of missions in a way. In, uh, in Genesis, and we'll look, uh, just look at Exodus 15, verse 55 and 6. Exodus 16, verses 5 and 6. Oh, am I reading this right? 19. Verse 5 and 6, my eyes are getting worse. As an 80-year-old, that seems to happen. Uh, and uh, in verse 5 and 6, now if you obey me, God said to the people of his day, God said to the, people, the Hebrew people, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, out of all nations you will be my treasured possession Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. A nation of priests, all of them, their job of a priest is bring God to the people and people to God. And, but they failed. In fact, when Jesus was here on earth, he said to the priests, you go over hill or val and valley to make one convert and you make them twice the child of the devil as you are. Wow, they failed. They were doing it, but they were doing it totally wrong. In the New Testament, it all changes because we become God's priests. And it says in several texts, we don't take time to look at them, that we are God's priests. He calls us saints too. We are saints not because we're holy, but because of his power, his cleansing, his purity in our life, we become holy. And it's nothing to do with us. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of Jesus to us. And uh, you see, we become priests. And therefore, instead of Israel being a nation of priests, they failed badly at it. It's now our responsibility. You say, well, that's why there's no word missionary in the Bible. Because we don't need missionaries. The whole church is to be missionaries. And it, it says in, in Matthew 29, the last chapter, it says that, go ye into all the world and make disciples. The main verb in that verse is not go, it's make disciples. The word go is a passive word. It's not an active word. It's like wherever you go, anywhere you go, whatever you do, wherever you are, make disciples. That's what it is. It's not a command to go. It's wherever you go, do that, make disciples. And, uh, and teach them everything that I've taught you. That is to go and make disciples to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to teach them all things that I've taught you. And that is, the things Jesus taught them was go, <laughs> make disciples, and, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I'm discipling a couple of young men, four young men at our church when they're all there. And they have grown immensely as I sit with them and talk with them how to be a real child of God, and how to take faith. One of these guys, very shy, quiet, soft, 
spoken, you can hardly hear him talk. He's quiet, quiet, quiet. You know what he's doing now after a few months of my mentoring? He's street preaching. <laughs> he was scared of people before. Now he, he saw some people preaching on a street corner near a big mall downtown Hamilton. And he said, maybe I can do it. And he was scared. And he says, but Jack said to not fear anything, to be bold. So he tried it. And he liked it. And so the next time they were there, he was there with them, preaching on the street. Hallelujah. And now he speaks stronger. He doesn't talk softly. He talks big because he's been growing spiritually and coming alive. And many of his psychological problems are disappearing because he's focusing on the master, not on himself. Part of our problem is we look too much at us. Oh, I'm so weak. Oh, I can't do this. So what? God doesn't take all he asks, the only ability he asks for from us is availability. He asked that of Moses. And Moses said, I can't speak. And God tried again, but I can't speak. I, I'm not eloquent. And eventually God gave in and made Aaron the spokesman for Moses. That was wrong. Moses didn't have the faith to believe that God could make him a powerful witness. Don't be like Moses. He ended up not getting into the promised land. And that's sad. You can find great fulfillment in saying yes to him, no matter what he casts you to do, and pay the price. That's what he's called us to do. Obey him, serve him, love him. Dare to go beyond your limits. Dare to do things that you thought impossible. The disciples didn't have the power to do that until after Pentecost. But when they went out powerfully, they impacted the world. In fact, I've been in India where <clears throat> there's a whole lot of Thomasinian churches planted by Thomas, the doubting Thomas. <laughs> he just was a very pragmatic man and he wanted to see it. And then he founded churches and there's a big hill there where he was imprisoned in a building and uh, they take you downstairs and show you where he was imprisoned. And uh, there's a monument outside of the disciples and Thomas. And there's churches all over India that are Thomasinian churches. They're a little more Catholic than we would like, but they're there. And it's because a doubting Thomas said yes to the Lord. And because a Peter who blundered so much said yes to the Lord. It's because people with lack, lacking abilities, it was young Bar Mark, when they came to get Jesus, young Mark ran away, and you'll read in one of the Gospels, without his clothes. They took his cloak. He ran away, what they would consider naked. He still had probably uh, a wraparound on it as a midsection. But how could God use a Mark? Well, he did. He wrote the second Gospel. God can use anyone who's willing to be used if you're willing to pay the price. He paid the price for you. It's your turn now. If you want to see the church go beyond its size and you have a good congregation here, focus on the world. Get a passion for the world. Get a passion for all the countries. Don't believe the news. The Muslims are not bad people. They are good people. If you're near one of their tents, any Muslim is required by, Mosaic, by uh, Quran law to welcome you into their tent, to feed you, and to give you accommodations for as many nights as you want. That's requirement. And they're like that. They're like that. Uh, some of them look scary. We were in uh, Sudan, uh, and uh, there was a place called Suwaka nearby. They, in fact, instead of giving us the port that we were told we would have, Port Sudan, which is a big industrial port, they made us, because we're a Christian ship, go up a remote river, way up to a place called Suwakan. We didn't know it was very remote <laughs> in the desert area. And uh, that's where they ship the camels and creatures out to the other countries for Ramadan and for special events. 
uh, to be slaughtered. And very interesting to watch. But anyway, we were at Sawakan. And we started walking to the town nearby uh, to buy some watermelon. They had abundance of it. They're in the desert. I don't know how, but they did. And in walking there, we saw a tent to the right. And there was men in there, all of them, talking loudly. And some of them looked pretty scary, <laughs> just the way they dressed. And they had, some of them had big knives on the table with them. And a man came running out of the tent and said, come and join us. Come on in. I'll give you coffee or food, whatever you want. And I said, oh, we can't. They're all just men in there. You don't have women in there. He said, I own the tent. I bring in whoever I want. <laughs> so we went. And one guy was there glaring at us. He was glaring at us. And he looked pretty fierce and scary. And some of them asked, we heard that on your ship are, uh, you have men and women. And you probably have AIDS there and so on. And Christians, there's a lot of bad Christians. I said, oh, is that right? Well, tell me, are there any bad Muslims? Oh, yeah, lots of them. Are there any bad Hindus? Yeah. Are there good Hindus? Yes. Are there good Muslims? Yes. I said, well, we're no different. We have bad Christians. We have a good ones, too. And we are the good kind. And they laughed and they thought, oh, interesting. They don't laugh much. And I became friends there in that tent out in the desert sands with them. And that was amazing to me. You see, the world isn't as you see it. God can move, use anybody anywhere to do great things if you'll only believe him enough to do it. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we need to stand on the promises of God. Our pastor years ago, uh, many years ago when I was young, said we should not be sitting on the premises, but standing on the promises. I like that. And if you stand on the promises, you can go anywhere and do anything for the kingdom of God. I was born a poor kid in East Hamilton in a one block long street. People who don't even know what's there, Archibald Street. And uh, I didn't have my own clothes that were bought for me until I was about 14, because I got all hand-me-downs and patched up jeans and all that stuff. That's all I had. How could a guy like that do what I've done? It's because of God. When I got saved, I was so transformed. I was invited to speak in churches at 15. I was invited to speak to 70 college students at a church in Hamilton, 70 university students, and I was 15. And it went well. They were really blessed and touched by it. That's God, not me. That's God. So God can use you. Don't say he can't. He can use any one of you. And I challenge you to say, yes, show me what you want me to do, God. And if you ever are interested in going on the ship ministry, you go on as a teenager, you come back as a mature, wise adult. You do. It's quite a rich international experience with a lot of good teaching while you're there. So I want to challenge you with missions. You are the priests. God had to give up on Israel. They failed. But now you are the missionaries. He didn't call the missionaries because you are the church, and that's what our job is. It's not to just sit and grow sour and fill up with truth. It's to get out and share it with others. That's what his call is. So this is a message for you. I believe from God. Awake the church. Stir us up, Lord, so that we can fulfill your plan for us. And his plan for us is that we reach the world. Look what 12 disciples did. Soon after the disciples started spreading, they were in all over that part of the world. In England, they have Christian churches that were built 2,000 years ago by Christians who fled there because of persecution in Jerusalem. And soldiers of the Roman army who were saved were building some of those churches. I mean, God can use you. I don't care how weak you are, how small you are, or how little you know. 
All it takes is availability. I'm willing, Lord. Here I am. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my voice and let it speak and sing always only for my king. Take my life and I will be ever only all. That's Christian commitment. Ever only all. The ever means no turning back. All means nothing withheld from him. I, won't, I have no reserve. Nothing I'll say I won't do for you. And all means there's no limit to where you'll go or what you'll be. I want to challenge you young people to say, God, I'm willing. I want to obey your great commission. Wherever I go, that I'll be a missionary. And not just, it doesn't just say convert people. That's not what it says. When Jesus was leaving the earth, he left his most important message. Go, and the active statement is make disciples. And that takes time. And not just evangelizing. Make disciples. Teaching them all that I have taught you. That's where the power is. That's what builds a strong, powerful church. And I mean the church universal. If we obey his voice and do what he says, the whole world can be impacted. I'll tell you what, you want to see Jesus come again. The Bible says that it says there'll be troubles and wars and earthquakes and famine. He said, these aren't the signs. He says, but when the gospel is preached in every nation, the word is ethnos in Greek. It's every ethnical group, every tribal group, every place in the world, then well, is the time that I will come again. So by missions, you prepare the way for Jesus' return. And that's critical. I would challenge you to become a powerful mission church. I, I, in Toronto at People's Church, they have 140 missionaries they fully support around the world. That's great. And that's the kind of church it is. And it was he, the pastor there at People's Church, who invited this young man who came to a prayer meeting. His name was Billy, and he invited him to speak for 15 minutes because Billy asked if he could. And when he was done his 15 minutes, uh, Oswald J. Smith was his name. He said, why are you stopping? He said, well, you give me 15 minutes. So go on, go on. And he arranged the Billy Graham crusade in Toronto that I was at way back in the 50s. So, wow, God can use anybody. He used me. He can use you. In fact, in the Bible, you know, he used a donkey to speak to the prophet. And so if God can use donkeys, he can use you. <laughs> Amen? Anybody, I would challenge you to surrender your life and say, God, show me where and how and I'll be, obey you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Help us, Lord, to submit to your voice, to be led by you and taught by you and transformed by you so that we can take that same transformation to others that we meet. So at school, at work, or anywhere in town we are, that will show your love. Make us your disciples, Lord. Those who would learn at your feet, so we'll be like you. And people will see you in us. And then we'll fulfill the great commission so you can return sooner because the gospel is preached in every tribe and nation. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. There's an organization that God is using greatly to go to remote locations. It's called Galcom. Galilee Communications. It's Canada's base is in Hamilton, run by a president's uh, personal friend of mine, a guy I, I mentored in a way. And uh, <clears throat> they parachute radios in. One beautiful story, like there was a rebellious area in the Columbia, along the Columbia River, uh, in an in uh, area that police didn't even go fire. Uh, soldiers never went because it was too dangerous. 
and they started parachuting pre-tuned radios in there that were tuned to an a antenna on a high mountain nearby. And uh, they parachuted in many radios. It was a long time before they heard anything because people didn't travel into that part. It was too dangerous. But someone came out of the valley and said, we need help. We've been listening to your broadcasts, and now we have five churches in our villages, and we don't have trained pastors. Can you come and help us? They were the ones that you were to fear and would kill you on sight with no conscience. Now they had a conscience because they heard God's word and they're transformed. You know, God's at work. God's at work. Join him in his work. God bless you.